Hi, I am Gianna, the pet engineer. This is a radio talk show dedicated to help people to construct a better connection with their pets. To listen to our show, you can visit us at petengineer.com. Also, check my new book, Numerology for Pets, at amazon.com. Today, I have Karen Schwartz, who is the President and Assistant Director of the Training for Tender Loving Canines Assistance Dogs Incorporated. They are specialized in training service dogs for those with limited abilities. Some of their programs are for children with autism and for wounded warriors. If you want to know more about their work, visit their website at www. TenderLovingK9s.org. Once again, TenderLovingK9s.org. Karen, can you tell me more about uh, your Wounded Warriors program? Yes, we had placed two service dogs with two veterans who were medically discharged from the military. These were very successful placements. So we then contacted the Wounded Warrior Battalion West at Camp Pendleton, California, which is very located very close to our facilities. And it houses 200 wounded warriors that are newly returned from deployment about starting a program there. So six months later, after establishing the proper military protocol with the Marine Corps, in March 2011, we were on the base with our first dogs ready to start. So in the last four months, we have placed four dogs on base with the men and women living in the Wounded Warrior Battalion. These applicants all have their very individual needs as well, from post-traumatic stress disorder, commonly called PTSD, traumatic brain injury, or TBI, and also mobility issues, you know, from amputations and severe injuries, and some needing seizure response dogs as well. Both the autism program that we do and the Wounded Warrior program encompass individuals with triggers that cause sensory overload in many forms and result in the individual not being able to function in certain situations. These triggers might be smell of a barbecue, smell of blue boil, the helicopter noise, crowds. There are many, many triggers that have come into their life as a result of their deployment. The tools taught to the wounded warrior for using the dog to alleviate these overloads needs to be addressed for each unique applicant and practiced with gradual progression so they can overcome these roadblocks as effectively as possible. So we start by working on the base near their barracks or you know where they're living so they're comfortable. Then we might take them to the commissary or other stores on base. And when the wounded warrior works up to progressing going off base, say to a mall, the picture changes and they feel a whole lot more vulnerable. This too needs to be worked through or they will continue to not go out in public, say if you place a dog with them and they go home, they still aren't going to take an active part in their public life, the life that they can't do right now. So these placements can be slower and much more intense than other service talk placements that we have experienced. And again, this can't be accomplished in just giving them a dog and working with them for five days and they take the dog home. Our goal is to teach them how to mitigate their hyper vigilance and their physiological reactivity to a situation, something they have little control of right after they come back. This immediate reaction is what kept them alive in the war zone, but they need to learn how to use the dog in this situation once they're home because the anger will decrease, the impatience and other symptoms that are not that are not acceptable in a public setting on the home front need to decrease greatly if they are going to be accepted properly in society. Something we found as simple as them not being able to tolerate standing in a line when someone in front of them is taking too long to find their money can be turned into a game with their dog where otherwise they're yelling at the person in front and swearing at them because they just can't handle it. So we've taught them to think, Duke, isn't he an idiot? He can't even find his money. And then he cues Duke to give him a high five on cue 
and then he can smile at his dog and tolerate the aggravation and wait a little longer in line. Oh, wow. And, and lastly, only he and Duke know what he's thinking, so he can be thinking whatever he wants, and it's acceptable. But we, we sit back and we watch things like this to figure out, okay, how can we teach him to handle this? And then, lastly, he can go to the movie or do things that he right now can't do. Is there an interesting story you would like to share with us? Yes, there's one that I have personally witnessed, a service dog giving a wounded warrior her life back. I interviewed an injured Army captain, uh, myself, along with our director of trainer, and she applied to us for a dog. So she reached out to us, but she had very great difficulty allowing us into her home on the first interview even. Her home was her safe haven at that time. Outside her home was not at all. She had a leg injury and severe PTSD. She was going to be discharged from the military, something she did not want to take place at all. She loved the military. She was a captain over 200 men and women under her. She did not want to give that up. She only felt safe going to her medical appointments on the base. Otherwise, she did her marketing at midnight when no one else would be in the store, and she remained in her house the rest of the time. After six months, she was able to go to a mall and use the tools that she was shown and practiced with her trainer and dog and was able to attend a sellout Charger football game. And for the holidays, she flew back east by herself with her dog. These were absolutely major accomplishments. Her dog turns the lights on when she comes home to a darkened house. It has to go up three levels of stairs. It refocuses her after a nightmare at night because her dog wasn't in the theater in the war zone. So she realizes she's here now where before she wouldn't move because she wasn't convinced there wasn't someone else in her house. Her dog leans into her when she just taps her leg when she feels her anxiety escalating. She taps her leg and the dog leans its head into her and she de-escalates. Uh, the dog watches her back when in public and does retrieval work for her. She recently had a setback where she had to have her foot amputated after many surgeries since the pain would not go away. So she elected to go that route. She now is looking forward to getting a new prosthetic foot and starting sports again and having her life back. She even had, a, even had a going away party for her foot with her friends. But more importantly, her dog has given her a reason to live. Suicide is no longer a consideration, and there is no better gift. What is about the dogs and people? You know, Do you think it's because it's kind of unconditional love that the dog is, and unconditional attention as well the dog gives us? I think it's that, but the, jo the dog is also not judgmental. Understand maybe the fears that a wounded warrior is going through. And, you know, like everyone will say their dog knows when they're sick or when something's wrong. They really do pick up on things like that. And if you give the dog something to do in that situation, they will work to please you and do what you have taught them to do. That's why this works so well. So the dog will pick up when there's, say, the Wounded warrior is waiting for a medical appointment, and then the lobby is starting to get really crowded. They almost can't handle sitting there. The dog can, will walk over, just rest their chin on your lap, and look at you like, okay, I know you're getting all revved up, but it's okay. This is not a big deal. It's okay. You can do this. And they realize they can do this. It's just simple things like that that make it a successful journey for them when they thought they couldn't even walk into that room before or go to that appointment. I joined this group about eight years ago, and I love what I do, but there's so much more to be done. I mean, it, it almost drives you crazy, knowing that if we could put more dogs out there that are well-trained, that would help these people, or for us to be able to maybe help other organizations do this type of training, it would be a monster gift to the world. Karen, thank you so much for your time. Thank you, and thank you for letting me share. And now, some animal news from the pet engineer. I love my dog as much as I love Take action now. Don't let the hammerhead sharks be fished to extinction. Sharks play a vital role in maintaining the health of our oceans. Some U.S. hammerhead populations have dropped an alarming 98% in recent decades. But we can change it. First, stop eating them. We don't know what kind of shark will be on our plates. Second, 
get to know more about sharks, especially the hammerhead ones. And finally, share your knowledge with others. It's really about education. To make me realize that I love my dog as much as this is cute. A group of orphan tiger cubs in Azu in Thailand have a different substitute mom, a young chimpanzee called Duru. Duru has been trained to feed the cubs from a bottle of milk and has been doing the job for about a year now. The tiger cubs love Duru and Duru adopted them just fine. Hey, this is what I call motherhood instincts. As much as I love you, you make this is something unusual. Donkra is the offspring of a female zebra and a male donk, born in Haikang Zoo in China. He was graced with a donkey-shaped body and a zebra-like head. There were some difficulties during his birth, but zoo officials say that Donkra is doing great and already weights over 30 kilos. If you have any news, opinions or suggestions you would like to share, go to thepetengineer.com under the submission link. Thank you for listening to the Pet Engineer radio show. Ah, don't forget to check my new book, Numerology for Pets at numerologyforpets.com.